Hello everyone, my name is Nathan Cobb and I would like to welcome you to today's Credit Safe webinar. I am excited to be here with you and uh, fortunate as always to be with our awesome guests. But before we get started today, before we really jump into anything, I want to give you a few housekeeping things and a, a little bit of the ground rules like we like to do at the beginning of all of these. So just be aware, one, that we are recording this. So if for some reason you have uh, privacy uh, concerns or something like that, that you're not able to do that at your company, uh, this is your time to exit. Um, you can still receive the recording, so you can watch this later, but you won't be on live with us able to ask any questions or anything like that. Um, again, there will be a follow-up to this. You will be receiving an email after all of this, um, and you will be able to uh, have this recording, but also any links or any uh, information that we give that's outside of just the basic information. You don't have to worry about writing it down if you're, if you're not able to do so right now. That will be included in the uh, link that'll be in your email to the landing page all about this specific webinar. Um, this webinar is going to be uh, a more of a presentation style. So I want to make sure that as you're going along, if you have questions, don't hesitate to ask them. We won't answer them until the very end, but please don't hesitate to ask them and forget them or something like that. Um, the way you do that is at the bottom of your screen, there's a little Q&A with a text bubble underneath it. Go ahead. I already have my screen open for that, and I will be monitoring that throughout the entire webinar. So if you have a comment, if you have a question, if you need to get in touch with us for some reason, that is your way to do it. Go ahead. I'll be monitoring it. I will see it. And then what I'll do is I'll ask the questions live at the end. But again, if you have one, just throw it right in there, and we will go ahead and ask our speaker everything that's going on in those question and answer setup. Um, today, we're going to be discussing managing the demand for credit and specifically the opportunity uh, that is going on and the risk that comes with that with the increased demand for credit due to the pandemic. I'm excited to uh, introduce for the first time on our webinars, but not the last, uh, Gary Mendel, who's the president of Meridian Finance Group. Uh, Meridian Finance is a company that provides credit, insurance, and trade finance tools uh, that companies use to expand their U.S. and international sales. Uh, Gary has over 40 years of experience in domestic and international sales, distribution, credit, and finance. Uh, prior to Meridian, he held positions managing U.S. and export business development for companies in the pharmaceutical, aerospace, and plastic, it's plastics industries. And if that's not enough, uh, Gary has received the President's E Award, which is an export award, uh, and currently serves on the federal government's Trade Finance Advisory Council. So as always, we've tried to bring uh, a, a certified expert to you. And Gary, welcome. Uh, we're grateful to have you and glad to, to see you today. I'm glad to be here. Let me um, bring up, if I can, my um, slides. Absolutely. Take a minute. Go ahead and do that. I mean, you have a great background, but uh, we, will, we will see what you have to offer for us today. Okay. All right. Looking good. Cool. All right. Well, let me just get this out of the way so I can go ahead here. All right, hi everybody. What we're gonna be talking about today is the um, growing demand for credit amid the ongoing pandemic and the resulting economic downturn, and then how you can manage the credit risks that come along with this while continuing to do business. Demand for credit's nothing new. It's been increasing for some years before we got into COVID time. Um, debtors, customers have been calling their own tune more and more in terms of the payment terms they're willing to uh, pay under as opposed to the longstanding convention that sellers set the terms. Uh, this has been going on for some time, not only with individual customers, but also with um, large companies at the top of big supply chains. Boeing a number of years ago said to all of its suppliers, look, we don't care what you put on your invoices for payment terms. <clears throat> From now on, we're paying in 120 days and any number of other large corporates have done the same, which affects not only the immediate level of um, contractors selling to that company, but also a, a long and deep uh, uh, supply chain affecting many companies. But this increasing demand for credit 
is now being magnified by what's been going on since March and what likely appears it's gonna to continue to go on for another year, maybe longer. So what we're seeing is that companies are leaning that much more heavily on their suppliers for credit because they're facing limited access to working capital. Um, companies just don't have the same kind of access to bank lines, non-bank lines of credit, you know, factoring, you know, all the other types of credit that they've been as accustomed to, not as available. In this country, that's somewhat the case. If you're exporting, then you're going to find considerably that your com customers in other parts of the world, not just in emerging markets, but even in Europe with what's been going on in terms of the Eurozone issues and the, and the impending Brexit and so on, that access to working capital has been compromised. And therefore, instead of being able to look as much to banks and other lenders, companies are looking to their suppliers for longer terms and bigger credit limits as a way of getting working capital. In addition to these sort of cash flow related issues, there's also the balance sheet issues. Companies are facing a, a, a compromise to their financial flexibility as they become more leveraged, which makes them you know, less able to deal with the ups and downs. Your customers are getting paid slower by their customers. So to the extent that your customers are unable to pay you or just choose not to pay you until they get paid by their customers, that pushes out the credit terms longer and makes them require more credit from you. Their, your customers are sourcing goods through supply chains that are compromised. They're still trying as we all are to learn how to operate effectively with people remote or people in the plant, but physically distanced from each other. And companies are dealing with, with you know, daily change and the uncertainty of not knowing how long this was gonna go on for and what kind of shape <clears throat> an eventual recovery is gonna take. And, but at the same time, companies wanna keep doing business. Your customers wanna um, uh, 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 hold the course because eventually there's gonna be a recovery. Um, I'm in the school that thinks there's gonna be an awful lot of pent up demand for goods and services by then and that we're gonna potentially see a steep recovery uh, but we don't know when that's going to be, um, likely not in 2021. Beyond creditors having to be responsive to that demand for credit from customers, companies proactively continue to extend credit for the same reasons as they always did, but again, even more so in COVID time in order to book more order or to book orders while the opportunity still exists. Um, companies in some sectors don't know how long their customers are, our customers are going to be able to keep buying. They don't know how long the current level of the economy, even compromised as it is, is going to stay as good as it is right now. And so they want to book what orders they can while the opportunities still exist. And they want to do so in a way that enables them to outsell their competitors. You know, traditionally, companies didn't make a decision whether they were going to buy from supplier A or supplier B just because of what payment terms they gave. Everybody just gave net 30 and that was that. But now, you know, you see suppliers coming or customers coming and saying, hey, I've got another supplier who's offering me product that's similar to yours. I want to buy yours, but you're giving me 30 days to pay. They're giving me 90 days to pay. I'm going to have to go with that, you know, unless I can get those longer terms from you. So payment terms are becoming a competitive element out there. Um, Extending, extending um, more credit to customers enables you to um, purchase or produce more efficient quantities in your manufacturing or in your distribution, it, 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 thereby enabling you to strengthen your factory throughput or your, your own supply chains. And a really important phenomenon in terms of giving more credit right now is getting distributors to take more inventory. One of the things we've been seeing since the outbreak of the pandemic is distributors allowing their inventory to be um, uh, sold and then not replenishing it in the way they had in the past. Distributors have been becoming more like order takers because stocking the inventory is a much riskier proposition for them. If they have to pay sooner, then they're able to turn the inventory around. Uh, what, that, what impact that has on you as a supplier is uh, you, um, you have to maintain more inventory yourself. So if a distributor gets an order and they don't have stock, 
and they come to you and say, hey, I need to get product so I can deliver it to the end user. And if I can't get it from you fast, I'll order it from somebody else or I'll lose the business to the distributor down the road. Instead, you wanna be able to open up enough payment terms, whether that's 60 days, 90 days or longer to incentivize your distributors to get back to stocking the levels of inventory that makes sense economically. The other impact of this is that results in your products being staged nearer to the end users, which is always what you want with distribution, especially now when um, supply chains and logistics have been compromised. So you want that product to be there closer to the end users. So once you cross that Rubicon and recognize that you're gonna to need to give more credit now than you have um, perhaps in the past, you've got to deal with some challenges. And the principal challenges are the risks of getting paid or not getting paid and the working capital challenges. So starting with the, the payment risks, again, non-payment risks have always existed when you give open account payment terms to customers, but now they've become uh, magnified in COVID time. More companies are filing bankruptcy or otherwise going out of business or becoming insolvent. Um, we haven't seen, we may not have seen the, the, the depth of this yet. I mean, most of the predictions we're reading about are that we're looking at first quarter, second quarter, 2021, before bankruptcies really hit their COVID time peak. Hope that isn't what's going to happen, but um, you know, we, we've, we've all got to plan ahead for contingencies. Companies that are still in business may not pay or may pay slow because of their cash flow or working capital issues, or as we discussed earlier, um, because of balance sheet issues. You know, a company that becomes more leveraged, a company that owes more relative to um, what it owns of its assets becomes more inflexible. And so if there are un, um, uh, uh, unanticipated events or, or actions that result in uh, uh, your customer not being able to pay all of their bills all on time, maybe you're gonna be the supplier who's being left hanging. Another source of risk is that AR is being concentrated now on fewer customers. Uh, in, in, in any number of our clients, uh, you know, may have been selling to 30 customers before, now they're selling to six or seven because the smaller companies, the smaller customers have fallen out because of the economic impacts and it's the bigger ones who are still there. Now the bigger ones, you may say, well, I'm not as worried about them not paying because they're big. But the reason to be concerned is not so much because you think this company or that company is gonna go out, rather because of the magnitude of the risk. When, that, when a single customer never owed you more than $100,000, yeah, that would be painful, but it wouldn't kill you if they didn't pay. Now that it's a million dollars, um, if that customer were to default, however unlikely that might be, that would be all she wrote for your company. Um, again, companies uh, may or may not, may, companies may not be able to pay or may have to pay slow because they're um, uh, dealing with lockdowns, whether themselves or lockdowns of certain of their suppliers in their supply chain that uh, uh, are, you know, are unable to deliver or unable to deliver timely, which means your customer can't turn things around quickly enough. And then of course, there are the direct impacts of the pandemic on your customers. One of the things that we caution our clients about at this point, because we've been seeing it happening, is not making assumptions about uh, uh, slow payments or non-payments resulting from the pandemic. There are, of course, any number of legitimate uh, reasons uh, or causes of non-payment coming about directly or indirectly because of the pandemic. However, any number of customers, particularly those that are displaying um, Poor payment morality in, uh, under these uh, you know, under these circumstances uh, are, are using the pandemic um, uh, spuriously as uh, an excuse for why they're not paying. And what you don't want to do is make that assumption yourself. And look at a customer who's paying slow and saying, "Ah, oh, well, this is because of the of the coronavirus," when that may not be the case, and there may be underlying issues instead. In addition to payment risks. Uh, uh, there's also the challenge of working capital. And there's really a trifecta here of factors that are, that are leading to uh, companies struggling, suppliers, sellers 
struggling with um, uh, working capital challenges um, resulting from this demand for credit and what it takes to respond to it. Number one, payment terms have grown longer. Net 90 is the new net 30. Um, uh, this is being driven by the, the um, economic impacts of the coronavirus, which you know are going to be long, with us long after the, the human issues, the, the health issues have been addressed. Um, some companies are, are asking for even more than 90 days, 120 days, even more. Second of all, customers may be paying slower. You know, they may or may not have access to working capital, as we've been talking about. Companies, companies who might have had a predisposition to pay a bit slow, that payment morality is now manifesting itself more materially because now slow doesn't necessarily just mean, oh, you gave net 30 and they're paying in 40. It may mean you're, paying, you're giving them net 60 and they're paying 60 days slow. And then of course, there are direct impacts of the pandemic. So these first two points taken together, if, you know, if you're giving a customer 60 days payment terms on your invoices and then they're paying you 60 days slow, that's 120 days. I mean, over the course of the coming, over the last six or eight months, and maybe for the next 12 months or longer, your customers may continue to always pay you. You may never suffer defaults, hope you don't. But some of those customers may be paying you, um, you know, 60 days slow on the 60 day terms you've given them, and you may not be seeing money until 120 days. So unless you've got a hell of a lot of working capital, that 120 days means how do you continue filling new orders? How do you pay the light bill? How do you keep paying your workers and keep them on payroll and so on? And this um, uh, uh, stretching out of DSO is juxtaposed with the increasing difficulty of getting receivables financing. Uh, banks face regulatory challenges and all asset-based lenders face credit challenges to monetizing receivables when the receivables come with longer payment terms, um, uh, debtors who are paying slow, uh, greater risk concentrations, and just generally during the downturn, um, you know, bankers are going to have to think about, are thinking about, you know, what are we going to say to regulators down the road when the question comes up of, you know, what were you thinking? Extending, you know, extending this kind of financing on receivables when these kinds of longer terms and slow payments and concentrations and so on were being manifested. So how do you deal with this demand for credit? Well, number one, you carefully evaluate customers' credit worthiness or reevaluate it, even if they're existing customers, and then extend them terms that are as competitive as they need to be to help you keep doing the business you want to keep doing. You get trade credit insurance to protect the accounts receivable against non-payment risks. And then if, you, this, if, if extending the payment terms brings you up short on working capital, you monetize the insured receivables with financing from a bank or some other asset-based lender because <clears throat> if the receivables are insured, this makes them a whole lot more attractive to, um, you know, to financers. <clears throat> so first to talk briefly about some of the information that can be gathered to analyze or reanalyze customers' credit worthiness. I'm not gonna suggest that it's easy to go back to a customer you've been selling to for five years or 10 years and start asking them for credit and financial information that you maybe haven't been asking for along the way. <clears throat> um, uh, it's understood that could compromise the integrity of your relationship with your customer. And if you're dealing with companies in some other parts of the world, world, it, it would be a complete buzzkill. I mean, in Asia, in China, and some other markets, you just don't go to a customer who you haven't asked for financial or credit information before, and then suddenly start doing it in the middle of the relationship. Um, but the, the point of this slide is to say, if you could, these would be cogent things to do to up your credit game in terms of how you understand your customers. Um, getting trade reference, you know, getting trade references from other suppliers, seeing how others in your sector are doing in terms of, of um, credit being extended to these customers and how well they're paying. Of course, your own ledger experience is the greatest trade reference, but you want to try and just, you know, uh, 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 triangulate that with what other suppliers are seeing as well. Getting financial statements is important. Um, everybody now in the credit world is not living off of the audited uh, December 31, 2019 financials. 
um, uh, we're looking for June 30s, or now that we're in November, we're looking for September 30 figures uh, to tell us how are the companies doing in 2020? Um, because nobody was thinking about coronavirus when they were finishing up 2019. Credit bureau reports, um, you know, they're an extremely important part of this mix. Um, I'll leave it to Credit Safe to talk about their reports. Um, uh, we use them. I'm, I'm sure a lot of you use them. It's extremely, it's extremely valuable as a way to, to again, triangulate with the information you get, you know, directly yourself through your own uh, digging into the financials and, and trade references and so on. Uh, industry creditor groups are very helpful from the National Association of Credit Managers, the Credit Managers Association, other groups, ad hoc groups of credit managers that get put together in certain sectors. There's more information online available than there ever has been, which is a good thing because we can't travel as much as we want to. Um, we're having to take advantage of new tools to visit um, uh, customer sites uh, uh, virtually. Um, having video dialogue with customers, as well as customers, 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 banks, etc., to do everything you can to understand what's going on with the, um, uh, you know, with your customers' business. Um, in our second session, a week from today, we'll talk in much more depth about credit insurance. I'm going to give just a brief uh, 101 here, just to, to set the stage for that. Um, and because I spoke about it earlier as, as a key component of being able to rise to the challenges of, of managing the credit demand. Um, but in our next session, we're going to talk a lot more about what the, best, what the best, best practices are for getting credit insurance in COVID time, how credit insurance has changed from a, a buyer's market to a seller's market, what to do to help ensure that you get paid if you ever have claims, et cetera. That'll be our, our topic next time. But first of all, just to give a quick intro, um, I imagine most of you know what credit insurance is, but for those who don't, it's a, it's, a, it's a policy that sellers or creditors buy to protect their accounts receivable against non-payment risks. If a customer is covered under a credit insurance policy and that comes to customer defaults, meaning they went past the due date, if you've given net 60 and it's 61 days and you didn't get paid, that's a loss. Um, and if that debt cannot be collected, then the party that's insured can file a claim and get indemnified. <clears throat> By protecting receivables against non-payment risks, it gives sellers the confidence to know that one way or another, they're gonna get paid. That enables them to extend competitive payment terms to continue doing business with their customers on credit, even during a downturn like this one, to increase the profitability of their sales. And what I mean by that, for example, is what we talked about earlier in terms of getting distributors to take more, to stock more inventory, because transferring inventory costs from your shop to your distributors, uh, you know, definitely increases profitability because keeping inventory yourself is expensive. And credit insurance enhances sellers borrowing capacity because without it, like we said before, banks and other lenders are facing real challenges at monetizing AR with the insurance the, the, um, and the bank or lender named as assignee or loss payee, they're in a much better position to be able to include the receivables and borrowing base to lend against them or finance them. Credit insurance policies can be on all of a company's whole turnover of all their sales. It can be on key buyers, you know, just a company's top 10 or top whatever, <clears throat> or some other kind of spread of risk. Is it possible to get coverage on just a single customer? Yes, but it better be a pretty strong credit. Otherwise, you really re need, need to rely upon the spread of risk to get an underwriter to look at each individual or one of your customers as they're getting the good with the bad. <clears throat> Premiums, the cost of credit insurance is low. It's typically a fraction of a percent of the insured invoice amounts, pennies per $100 invoice. Claim filing can be, you know, if you have a loss and you're going to file a claim, if a customer isn't paying you because they, be, they went bankrupt, generally you're going to file a claim as soon as you can because there's no reason not to. On the other hand, if your customer is just paying slow for whatever ever number of reasons, including COVID related reasons, any policy is going to provide a flexible window of time 
for you to work with your customer. You don't have to take advantage of that window, but many companies do because you wouldn't want to bring the hammer down on a good relationship customer um, uh, prematurely. So, the, so, so policy may allow up to months of time for you to keep trying to work things out with your customer before you would need to file a claim if you're gonna. And then under a policy, there's several different ways that customers can get a customer credit limits can get approved. Every customer has to have a credit limit under a policy, but the way that gets done can vary. Some insurance companies, they look at every single one of your customers and they make their own credit decision based on their own database of information on customers and their own algorithms. Other insurance companies are a great deal more interested in you, your credit procedures, your, your track record, um, how you're doing, how your aging looks and so on. And so some underwriters will even go the distance of giving you the pen. They'll say, look, you can make your own credit decisions as long as you follow the credit procedures that you know, you've set forth or that we've mutually agreed on, then you can keep making your own credit decisions and we'll cover that. We, the insurer, don't even have to look at your, um, your individual customers one by one. We're gonna just base this on, we're gonna base the coverage on you following um, uh, the agreed credit procedures. And many policies are hybrid. A given policy might say, look, any credit limit you wanna give up to $250,000 on your own, you can, you, know, you can do that following these guidelines. If it's a bigger credit limit than 250, then you know, you'll submit it to us for underwriting. Where do you get credit insurance? Well, when I, when I first started brokering credit insurance, which was 27 years ago, there were maybe four or five different carriers in the US. Now there's um, two dozen, actually you know, closer to 30. Um, there are the multi-line carriers, which have all different kinds of commercial and personal lines, names you'd know like AIG, Chubb, the Hartford, Allied World, Zurich, and so on. There are specialty insurers who, who also have multiple lines, but they're all specialty lines like surety and that kind of thing. And one of the specialty lines they write is credit insurance. Names like Great American, Houston Commercial Casualty, Liberty Mutual, Markel, and so on. Um, all of these are A-rated insurance companies, whether you've heard of them or not. There's not really any B players in this business. There are what are called monoline underwriters, which um, only write credit insurance policies. Names that the most common names are Euler, Cofas, and Atreides. These are European insurers who have long been in the United States. And then there are some newer entrants to the market like Receivasure. There are government agencies, um, the, the biggest 80 or 90 economies in the world. Uh, their governments have an export credit agency. In the US, it's the Export Import Bank of the United States or Exim Bank. And then beyond all these carriers in the US, you've got another 50 or so at Lloyd's of London who write credit insurance and, and a growing number of these are available now in the US on a surplus lines basis. Uh, at Meridian, we're a broker. We specialize in, in credit insurance. We work with all of these insurance companies. So to, to review and set the stage for what we're gonna talk about next week, credit insurance is a risk management tool. It's a sales tool and it's a financing tool. As a risk management tool, it protects AR against non-payment, enables you to keep selling even during the downturn with confidence because you know one way or another you're going to get paid. And it strengthens your balance sheet assets, just like you protect your building, you protect your workers, you protect your equipment, you protect your inventories. Um, arguably just as risky a asset on your balance sheet as your accounts receivable. And, and so having that protected with insurance, just like you protect all those other assets uh, is, is, a, is a cogent compelling thing to do. Credit insurance is a sales tool because it lets you extend more competitive payment terms. It lets you ship more product, transfer inventory carrying costs to your distributors and, 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 keep, your, uh, and keep your goods um, as far downstream in the supply chain as you can. And it's a financing tool that maximizes um, um, the value of your receivables as collateral. It maximizes your borrowing base for the lender helps you monetize your accounts receivable and helps you negotiate favorable advance rates and even favorable interest rates. Um, 
that concludes my comments for this uh, first uh, webinar, but I'm very happy to entertain any questions or, or hear what you guys are experiencing in uh, COVID time from a credit perspective. Absolutely. And thank you, Gary, uh, for this. And like Gary was saying, we do have another one of these coming up specifically on the idea of credit insurance and all that's going on there uh, in response to the demand for credit and COVID and everything. But uh, I do want to say as we go into the Q&A portion, we do have some questions here, but joining us for Q&A today uh, is Mabel Lewin, who is the Western Regional Director for International Insurance Services. Goodness gracious, that is a long title. Uh, at, the, at Meridian Financial Group. Uh, Mabel has many years of experience in the financial services sector um, and is just jumping on to provide a different perspective, a variant perspective uh, on your questions and everything. So I'm going to kind of mix up the questions. They did come in as, as we were kind of going through. So just kind of, so that we don't feel like we're going back through the, the order, I'm going to mix them up a little bit here. And folks, we do have some time. So if you have other questions or these spur other questions, please jump in and, and ask them. So the first one, very general, um, but are there certain parts of the analysis of credit that you recommend it over others? So I'm assuming that this means that that list that you had, is there something that they should prioritize? Um, you know, it really varies from circumstance to circumstance. It really varies with what you can get. If all of us were only selling to investment grade companies, well, we could just look at their S&P and Moody's ratings and that would be that. But <laughs> right. many of us are selling to the middle market or small businesses, et cetera, sure. let alone in other countries where, you know, you, you have to work with what you can get. Um, if you were to ask me uh, generically what, what, you know, our favorite is, it's trade references. You know, when we're looking at a piece of business ourselves and they ask how many trade references of ours do you want, we're like, how many have you got? You know, because because if you get six, that's better than two because you're trying to build a story. You're trying to understand the company. Um, when you're doing business internationally, trade references um, uh, provide not only a, um, a view into the company's pay, the customer's payment morality, but also into how well they can get dollars. And that's never been a small thing. And it's no small thing now in COVID time, as any number of emerging markets are, are, are struggling with um, uh, access to hard currency uh, or companies in those countries. Sure. So, you know, when you get a trade reference from a company in, um, say, your, your customer's own country, uh, yes, that can tell you about their payment morality and how well they pay, but doesn't tell you how they pay in dollars. If you can get credit references from suppliers in the U.S. or Europe or Canada or, um, you know, other hard currency countries where they've got experience being paid in dollars or yen or, 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 or pounds or, or um, euros. That also tells you that one way or another, that company is getting, you know, whether, whether they're going through official channels, whether they're going into the gray market for, for, their, do, for their hard currency, it tells you that, that where the rubber meets the road, they're able to access um, uh, the, the hard currency to be able to pay. So, uh, you know, in, any or all of these, these um, uh, uh, ways of gathering information on the list are important. But if you were to ask our number one, I'd say trade references because notwithstanding all the rest, how well they're paying other suppliers uh, uh, tells you a lot. Sure, it makes total sense. Um, we, we would say, you know, check out those credit bureaus because we include that as well as the, the verification of it. But, you know, we'll go with whatever, uh, you know, we, it, it, it works. And, and, and you're right, it's how, how their experiences of, of paying people makes total sense. You know, if, you're, if they're gonna pay other people, they're most likely to pay you as well, so. Um, that's great. Well, so I'm going to con the converse. The converse is more the case. If they ain't paying other people, you really want to. <laughs> well, yeah. And this is the thing. You, you you do have to also take into account who they're paying, because right. if if the credit references are coming from large suppliers who are very important to that customer, and you maybe you are not as high on that uh, list, mm -hmm. who, who's going to who's going to get left uh, behind uh, when when cash gets tight? Sure. Sure. Absolutely. All right, so I'm going to just keep rolling with, with these different questions. Uh, what do we do if a company is paying slowly, not whether because of COVID or not, they're not sure, um, but they're a Keystone account? I guess the question kind of is like, how much do we ask? Do we, do we care that they're paying slowly because of COVID or not? If that's not correct, please follow up on that question and let me well, know. But that's, that's where I'm interpreting it. 
Um, well, yeah, I mean, this is the whole issue we talked about before with concentrations. You know, if, if it was someone who owes you $10,000, it's like, okay, we, you know, if, if, if we don't give them the credit and they stop buying from us, it's only $10,000. If right. we give them the credit and they burn us, it's only $10,000. The whole issue here is the concentrations are rising and these numbers get to pose an existential risk to your business. Um, I'm, I'm gonna circle back to credit insurance here when I say that's part of the key. Again, um, you know, we have, for example, a client who has a policy that they've had for years. It's a $20 million limit on an overseas or several overseas um, locations of Hewlett Packard. They don't buy the policy because they think Hewlett Packard's gonna go out of business. They do it because 20 million would put them out of business. Um, and so, uh, Credit insurance, when you're talking about companies paying slow, credit insurance policies generally define prompt payments as not more than 60 days slow for domestic business and not more than 90 days slow for export business. Mm -hmm. So there is, a, there is some amount of leeway there, understanding that companies may pay you know, not, not exactly timely. Um, some of our clients use that same kind of thinking themselves, like, okay, the company isn't paying timely, but they're only you know, 30 days slow or 45 days slow or whatever, that's still okay. But when it gets to a certain level, then they, you know, then they might cut them off. Right. Uh, it's, 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 it's really a difficult question when you have a customer that you really need and really need to hold on to, and they're paying you slower and slower, you have to figure other ways to try and work with it. I mean, there are other things like standby letters of credit, like performance bonds, like taking a deposit amount and keeping it on escrow and so on. None of that is very um, uh, competitive or customer friendly. And that's <laughs> right. why doing things in the background like credit insurance can, um, you know, are a lot easier ways to, to manage that. Sure, sure. Um, and I think I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with that idea of competitiveness here. And you touched on it earlier uh, and you just talked about it there. When I asked this question is, how do I balance the C-suite's uh, appetite for risk with the competitive advantage that can be gained through different credit terms right now? Um, well, again, I mean, I don't, I don't mean to keep coming back to the same answer, but this sure. is part of the ticket with credit insurance. It's a, you know, ostensibly credit insurance is insurance. It's to help you sleep at night. But most of our clients, and we have hundreds of them, they use the credit insurance as a sales tool or as a financing tool. They're using it exactly for the reason that you just described is there's more business to be had or business not to be lost to competitors by opening up the payment terms more and this lets you do that. Absolutely. Um, all right, so here is another one and it's asking, what about if we are able to onboard new accounts? Should we handle them as we've handled old accounts or in a different way? Well, you know, to the extent you can, you want to take a hard look at all your customers. And you don't want to assume things about the ones. This is not a good time to be lazy about credit on the ones you've had a long time. <laughs> sure. But yes, if you're onboarding new clients, you do have an uh, you do have the ability now to maybe um, uh, uh, impose some credit practices that you maybe didn't over time. You know, we all do it. You know, you drift into a situation. You have a customer, you're building a relationship, they owe you 20,000, they owe you 40,000. And you turn around a year later, they owe you $300,000 and things have gotten to that point. You didn't necessarily have a disciplined uh, um, credit approach that as those numbers got bigger and bigger, you were starting to say, okay, we want financial statements. We want you know other ongoing uh, ways of tracking this because the relationship just grew and they've been paying okay and so on. With, with new customers, you do have that ability to um, uh, you know, tighten up. Again, we understand from indus one industry to another, that may not be easy to do, but, to, but, but yeah, a new customer, you, you can do things you might not be able to with once you've had around for a while. Absolutely. Of course, the downside with the downside with the new customers, you have no experience. I mean, you know, the one, right. the one who you've been selling to all this time, you, you know, that you've bootstrapped your way up to a certain credit limit, you, at least you have that history to work with. A new one, um, you know, you've never given them credit before. For that, some companies, what they do, uh, even if they didn't do this before, is they may take a deposit first time out. You know, you, you know, when you mentioned before the the C suite's appetite for risk. Right. You know, if the C suite's appetite for risk says, you know, if we don't have a full package, we don't want to give anybody more than fifty thousand dollars. Well, okay, if your first order is a hundred thousand, maybe that very first order, you you make them pay fifty thousand down and give them credit on the other 50 and say, look, you pay me good on this other 50, 
I'll go back and push management to give you, you know, credit on the whole hundred next time, something like that. Right. Right. Kind of that hybrid approach that'll, you know, be a little more creative. That's something we've heard in a lot of these webinars is, you know, do your due diligence, like you're saying, but be a bit more creative in working with folks right now, uh, just due to the extenuating circumstances that we're all dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, and I have one more question here, folks. So if you have, we do have a few more minutes. If you want to uh, add a couple of questions here, go right ahead. Um, and this one has to deal with the factoring industry. So we've never done factoring. Um, is that something we should add at this time or are we behind the curve on it? Well, I mean, I can tell you that factoring is alive and well. It's a very robust sector. Um, uh, I, I don't want to say even in COVID time, maybe especially in COVID time. Right. Um, we, we work with factors a lot um, on the credit insurance side. Um, uh, quick, quick factoring 101. There's two flavors of factoring, with recourse and without recourse. All right, um, with recourse factoring means you sell your receivable to the factoring company. In the event that your customer defaults, the factoring company and you have an agreement that the factoring company can turn around and make you buy that receivable back. That's what the recourse means. Um, if if um, you get non-recourse factoring, which tends to be more expensive, then when you sell the receivable to the factoring company, it's theirs. Um, and if your customer defaults, that doesn't provide, that doesn't give rise to an opportunity for the um, factoring company to require you to buy that receivable back. So, so it's, it's off your books for good. Um, you know, I mean, there are other things, you know, if there were disputes, if there was other uh, dilution of the receivable, that then, then the factor could come back at you, but they can't come back at you just uh, because of a customer default in the case of non-recourse factoring. How insurance dovetails with that is when it's with recourse factoring, the seller, you, get the credit insurance just like you always would, and then you name the factoring company as your lost payee or assignee on the policy. When a factoring company is factoring um, or a bank is factoring without recourse, then it's the factoring company who buys insurance to protect themselves because they're the ones who are gonna be stuck with the uh, risk in the event of default. Um, factoring works great for many companies. Some other companies don't like the expense. They don't, you know, they, they would rather just borrow against their receipt because that's your choice, right? If you've got receivables and you're gonna keep them on your books, the way you get um, working capital out of them, the way you monetize those receivables is to borrow against them as collateral from a bank or some asset-based lender or some investor. Um, factoring offers um, a different kind of opportunity because um, by, by having the factor actually take the receivables off your books and put it on their books, um, uh, factors can be more flexible with more different situations. They can work with newer companies. They can work with companies in more challenged financial positions and so on. Um, so uh, again, uh, uh, you know, we're seeing factoring now in COVID time be used in many more industries than it used to be. It used to be very much for the garment apparel business, plastics, any number of other sectors. We see you know, more companies factoring than they are now in, in sectors that they hadn't before. Um, and we've been hearing both from companies who are getting credit insurance for the first time so that they can name a factor as lost payee or assignee or, we're, or, or, and we've also been hearing from more factoring companies who are concerned about the same things we've been talking about, concentrations, longer payment terms, et cetera. And the factoring companies themselves who do the non-recourse factoring are buying uh, uh, credit insurance policies themselves. Great stuff. Um, and that appears to be it. I think you have covered what the, what the people want, Gary. I think you've, you've given them what they want here, which is great. And, and, Mabel, you know, you didn't even have to add anything. You did a great job. So you didn't. Thank you. <laughs> very, very Mabel, thorough. Maybe we'll have more to bring next time when we're talking about the credit insurance. Exactly. Exactly. And yeah, folks, next week, uh, Tuesday, the 17th, same time, um, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. We will be here again. We'll be talking about credit risk and opportunity in the vein of credit insurance. And like Gary said in his intro, and he said a couple of times here and, and in the video you may have seen on social media, it's not a credit insurance 101. We will do one of those in the future, that type of thing. But this is more uh, a, bit of, a bit of a deeper dive on, on what we're going to be dealing with and how this is going to look for your company, especially right now during COVID and everything like that. And like Gary said, 
uh, we don't see quite an, a, a light, a perfect light at the end of that tunnel. So we know it's going to be going on for a while. And uh, so this is something to, to really pay attention to. So uh, if you want to sign up for that and you haven't already, just go to creditsafe.com slash webinars and you can find that all day long. Gary, thank you. Mabel, thank you. And for all you folks that have been watching us and joining us, as always, thank you. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Have a great day, See you everybody. Next week.